I was 13 years old on September 11th, 2001. And like most Americans who are old enough, I remember the events of that day pretty vividly. And every year since then, people will share that image of the two towers in the background that says never forget. And as someone who spent 60% of my life post 9-11, I was only 13 at the time. It wasn't really something that affected me that greatly. It was just something that happened. It was a tragedy that happened, but I didn't really look into it. I didn't investigate it a lot, but you know, every September 11th, you just remember the day. But for the last five years or so, I've really started looking into it more, more looking into the people's stories, the victims' stories. And the story I'm going to share today is one of the most well-known civilian heroes of that day. His name was Wells Remy Crowther, and he was known as the man in the red bandana. This is So Sad, Stories of Survival and Death, a series where I talk about people in horrific situations, their lives, and how they either survived or died in that situation. So if that's something that interests you, please like and subscribe, and let's get into the video. Wells Remy Crowther was born May 17th, 1977 in New York City to parents Jefferson and Allison Crowther. He was the oldest and he grew up in Nyack, New York with his parents and his two younger sisters, Honor and Paige. When he was about three years old, he was given a ride on fire truck for Christmas from his grandparents and he absolutely loved it. He was always playing with it, always pretending to respond to emergencies and put out fires and all of that. And when he was seven, he asked his father, who always had a blue handkerchief on him in his pocket, he asked if he could have one and his father gave him a red one and told him the red ones are yours and the blue ones are mine. And it was a way that they could have, have something shared together, but also know whose was whose. And it was a little bit of individuality with it. And when he was younger, he used it as a toy. He used it as, you know, to pretend he was a pirate or, as a flag to signal races. And then as he got older, he would use it as a sweatband during his sports games. And it was something that became like his signature style. He always had this red bandana on him. In high school, he was the captain of the Nyack Indians hockey team. It was his favorite sport. And he was known as a selfless team player. And he also played lacrosse, was another one of his favorite sports, but he did a lot of various sports and he participated in his community sports programs. He was an honor student and a Boy Scout and he was a communicant at the Grace Episcopal Church in Nyack. And he was a happy and positive guy. He was the type of guy that would do anything for anyone. He give the shirt off his back to a stranger. He was just that type of person. He had a strong sense of a duty and he was very loyal to his family and friends. If they were clear in another state, he would drop everything and go help them if they needed it. If they needed something, he was one of the first ones to be there to help out. Honor has said that he was someone who was more proud of other people's accomplishments than he was of his own. He was just always so proud of what other people did and so excited for them. There was one time where he had just lost a game, a lacrosse game, and he went 
to cheer Honor on in her game. And even though her team lost, he was so excited that she scored three goals and she could hear him from the stands. And he was just, that's my sister, just so excited for her and just so proud of her. And he was just so supportive of the people in his life. He was tremendously self-disciplined, polite, caring, and well-spoken, and he was very confident. He had no issue with just going up to a girl and, and asking her out. His father was a volunteer firefighter, and so Wells would go with him to the firehouse and he would help them clean the fire trucks. He was able to get into the small crevices because he was a smaller kid. He started out at like 14, he became a junior firefighter. And then at 16, as soon as he was able, he started to train to become an actual firefighter. But after high school, he went to Boston College for four years and he graduated in 1999 with an economics degree. He got a job at Sandler O'Neill and Partners as an analyst, and soon he promoted to an equities trader. He had a strong work ethic and he was highly valued in the company, but he felt like he was meant for something more and he started to fill out an application for the fire department of New York. On September 11th, 2001, 24 year old Wells was in his office on the 104th floor of Two World Trade Center or the South Tower of the Twin Towers. When at 8.46 in the morning, Al-Qaeda terrorists flew hijacked plane American Airlines Flight 11 into the North Tower between floors 93 and 99. Wells talked to his college roommate after this. He told him that he was okay, that he heard and he felt the impact and that they were evacuating. He wasn't frantic at all. He was just letting him know, hey, I'm okay. At 9.03 a.m., 17 minutes after the first plane hit, hijacked plane United Airlines 175 struck the South Tower between floors 77 and 85. At 9.13, Wells called his mother, presumably from the 104th floor, and he left her a message saying, Mom, this is Wells. I just want you to know that I'm okay. At some point, Wells took his red handkerchief out of his pocket and he tied it around his nose and his mouth to act like a mask. And between 9.15 and 9.30, he started heading down to the 78th floor, which was the sky lobby, which is where the main elevators from the first floor would stop and the elevators that would go to the rest of the floors would start. And so if there was a ground zero of where the plane hit, this would have been it. Wells, with his experience, was able to locate the only functioning stairwell and he started directing people towards that. The visibility, it was really dark, no one could see, and a lot of people were afraid to move because if they moved, they might fall through the floor. And so they were just sitting on the floor, just waiting, not knowing what to do. Many of them were injured or in shock. And Wells just came in and started pulling people saying, you know, basically, look, we got to go. Come with me. He said, I found the stairs. Follow me. Only help those who you can help. And he would also stop people from going the wrong way, saying, don't use those stairs, come use these stairs. These ones are the ones working. And he went around and he uh, was just gathering people at the stairwell to get them to go down into groups down the stairs. And he extinguished a couple fires. And then he took a shocked woman who just couldn't move because she was in such a shock. He put her over his shoulder and he went with the first group down and he carried this woman over her shoulder clear down to the 61st floor where the air started to clear and the lights were back on and he set the woman down 
and then he went right back up to help more people. He made the trip at least three times before going down to the main lobby. And when he got there, he went to the firefighters and he started gathering tools, namely the Jaws of Life, to go help the people who were trapped. And at 9.59 a.m., the building collapsed with Wells inside. And for a week following the attack, his mother would call around all the different hospitals looking for him. There were so many missing people during this time. There, nobody knew if their loved one was still alive, if they were dead, if what had happened to them, where they were. There were some calls that were able to get through, but not everybody was able to talk to their family or did talk to their family. And so it was just so many unknowns about this and this really bothered Allison that she just wanted to know where her son was, what had happened to him, if he was even alive, anything, anything she wanted to know. And then on September 29th, 2001, they ended up having a memorial service for Wells because at this point they just figured if we haven't heard from him, if we haven't been called that he's been identified from one of these severely injured patients, then he's, he's gone. And at this memorial service, the church courtyard was filled and people were lining up on the street to attend this service. And that just tells you how loved he was by his community. I mean, at this time, nobody even knew what he did. They just knew he was gone. And they just wanted to be there to support his family and to show their love for him. But Allison just wanted to know what happened to her son. She just kept looking for him. And she would watch all of the documentaries, all of the news broadcasts, anything she could about the attack, just looking for any information she could find on Wells. And Wells' mentor and friend from the fire department went and assisted in the cleanup and every time he went, he, he would let Allison know, I'm still, I'm still looking for him. Six months after the attack on March 19th, 2002, Wells' body was found, and his body was found with firefighters and emergency workers in a suspected command post on the main lobby. His body was intact, but he was missing parts of his jaw and his right hand, and the, both of the wounds were consistent with falling glass. Finding his remains helped bring some closure to the family, but Allison just kept looking for him. She still just wanted to know what happened to Wells. On May 28th, 2002, Wells' father, Jefferson, who could still not bear to look at anything related to the attack. He avoided it. He he didn't he just couldn't handle it. And but he knew that Allison was just consuming all of the information she could about it. And he saw that the New York Times had published a comprehensive story of the attack titled fighting to live as the towers died and it was just a story from the survivors and it went through a timeline and location and so he gave this paper to Allison so she went through and found the section where she thought it was most likely that Wells would be present in and she noticed several times that this article mentioned a man wearing a red bandana. And she went to Jefferson and she said, I found him, I found him. Because she knew instantly that this was Wells. 
He had a red handkerchief. This was the location he would have been in. She just knew it was him. But she wanted to confirm it 100%. So she got into contact with the survivors who had credited the man with the red bandana as the reason that they survived. And she sent them photos and they confirmed that that was him. So it was through their accounts, through what they saw and other evidence where he was found that they were able to come up with this timeline for some of the things that he was doing during that last hour. His name is attached to many different memorial sites and there are so many things done in his memory. The college has a football game, the red bandana game. Most of the things are so associated with the red handkerchief, with this red bandana. And so many things are done in his memory. People remember him in so many different ways and he's still celebrated. There are books about him. Um, there's a children's book about him. There's a documentary. And on December 15th, 2006, Wells was made an honorary firefighter for the fire department of New York. And he was the first one to ever receive that title. And so he was officially given the title for the role he played that day. I know Wells's name and story is more celebrated than many of the other heroes of that day and so I highly encourage you to in this day of remembrance look into some of these victim stories some of these hero stories um, this day brought out the worst and the best in people and I find the best way to remember the day is to remember the people and with so many victims i think it we just can't comprehend that you know almost 3000 people died and there's no way that you can go through everybody's story and many of the people nothing is even known about them they were never recovered nobody knows exactly what happened to them, how they died, if they burned, if they jumped, if they died on impact. They, there's just so many unknowns for so many people. But I think it's important that we listen to the loved ones and learn about these people that died because they were victims too. So that's it for today's video and I will see you guys in the next one.